If you're familiar with the eclectic and disturbing corners of the internet that don't quite rise to the level of creepypasta, but nevertheless evoke a sense of peculiar fascination, you may be familiar with the YouTuber Ben Bennett. Bennett has multiple YouTube channels which he uses to post anything from improv to nature hikes to performance art. Bennett's most famous work is no doubt the YouTube series Sitting and Smiling, in which he sits silently for hours, staring into the camera with a smile on his face. Bennett's videos tend to run an average of four hours long and include infamous incidents of him becoming so unresponsive as to ignore a puddle of urine that appears and then dries beneath him over the course of the video. What fascinates Bennett's 368,000 subscribers and nearly 30 million viewers is the disturbing nature of his smile. There is no stated purpose for it. Bennett, who speaks with a Nathan Fieldarian measured tone, told Vice there really isn't a purpose. I don't think that question is really applicable to this type of activity. Sitting and Smiling is at least partly inspired by Claire Bishop's book, Artificial Hells, Participatory Art and the Politics of Spectatorship, which argues that focusing on explanations and rationalization of artistic works robs them of their power and critics and audiences should just focus more on the aesthetics of the work. Bishop's thesis borrows from two famous jocks, Lacan and Ranciere, who reached similar conclusions about life from two different fields. Jacques Lacan was a controversial psychoanalyst who bridged the gap between Sigmund Freud and traditional philosophers by stating that humans have what is essentially a reservoir of language waiting for us when we're born. As we move from being infants to toddlers and onward, we wade more deeply into that reservoir because we learn more words and we're able to express ourselves through complex sentences, paragraphs, and passages. But according to Lacan, that reservoir also separates us from the real world. See, Lacan thought that our drives were the closest we get to reality, and that the symbols we create, while helpful to us as social creatures, dig a chasm between us and reality. In other words, if you feel hungry or horny or in pain or in fear or ecstatic, those are physiological reactions. Your blood pressure rises, your heart rate increases, your brain produces adrenaline. They're real-world measurable phenomena. This is why Ranciere drew from the ancient Greeks when he referred to aesthesis, which is the awareness of sensation, as opposed to the intellectual understanding of it. It's the difference between feeling the warmth of someone's body pressed against yours in a sweaty, clenching sexual embrace, and having your high school gym teacher, who smells like an old sweat sock, explain the swelling of the testes. Don't have sex, because you will get pregnant and die. In other words, it's not, what does this make you think, but rather, how does this make you feel? And that brings us back to Benjamin here, whose smiling performance art makes audience members feel uneasy. But why? A smile is generally associated with good feelings, so why should Ben's smile be so off-putting? Both Lacan and Ranciere would say it's because that symbolic reservoir Lacan mentioned fails us at that point. As a culture, we like explanations for things. Some of us tolerate ambiguity better than others, but generally speaking, humans assign labels to things as a way of making sense of the world. We see patterns in clouds and ink blots. We associate an external shot of the White House with a set of the Oval Office in our minds, and we have no problem believing this is the Oval Office, even though we obviously know that they don't shoot movies and TV shows in the actual Oval Office. A smile is part of Lacan's symbolic reservoir. Evolutionarily, it benefited us to know when people were angry or sad or upset, afraid. Historically, if we make them happy, they're more likely to help us find food and shelter. If they show us that they're angry, we're more likely to know that we have to either engage in conflict resolution or fight. If they show us that they're afraid, we know that we're probably in danger too. The better we are at reading facial expressions, the more likely we are to avoid starvation or intertribe conflict or external predators and the more likely we are to pass on our genetic material. But what if all the other evidence we have conflicts with what we're seeing on the person's face? We know that a smile is indicative of an emotional state, and those are fleeting and temporary. A physical response to external stimuli, and when the stimuli are removed, the physiology returns to homeostasis. So when a smile is permanently affixed for hours on end, as it is in Ben Bennett's videos, we know that we're being communicated to conflicting pieces of information. When we have information that the person we're alone in the room with is angry or hostile, and they're smiling at us, 
The conflict between what we know and what we see amplifies our discomfort. The symbols we rely on so heavily have led us astray. The smile is a lie. Smile is Parker Finn's 2022 feature-length adaptation of his 2020 short film, Laura Hasn't Slept. As with many elevated horror films over the past five years, the film uses horrific imagery and situations to explore themes of unresolved trauma, mortality, and mental illness. As always, if you haven't seen the film yet, please be advised that this video contains spoilers. At this point, the theme is almost trite in the horror genre, but that's fine that the filmmaker's style and content are worthwhile, and if it has something to say. Of course, our lead character Rose is dealing with the trauma of her own, having found her mother's body when she was a young girl, it's not hard to assume that she's compensating for that trauma by becoming an idealistic superwoman clinical psychiatrist herself, especially when her boss, played by an appropriately on-edge Cal Penn, tells her that she needs to consider a break from her 80-hour weeks. Rose tries to leave and immediately gets sucked in with another patient. In this first five minutes of the film, Finn demonstrates techniques that are stylish but wholly in the realm of the genre film language. We get the slam cut to a character waking up, we get a gliding pan shot over the hospital and through a window, and the time-honored classic, The Canted Frame. Rose's new patient is Laura Weaver, played by the original short film's lead actress, Caitlin Stacy, and what plays out is a truncated version of the short film, but from the therapist's point of view. Laura is a college student who witnessed her professor kill himself, and now she's experiencing a severe form of PTSD-related anxiety. At least, that's what Rose surmises, based on Laura's file. Laura insists that she's not just experiencing a psychotic breakdown, she's actually being haunted, for lack of a better word, by some demonic force that imitates the people around her. And, most importantly, it smiles at her. It's smiling at me. Finn pulls a neat trick, sharply moving from a three-quarters or 45-degree angle on Laura to a close-up, where she explains right to our face. Rose matches her in close-up, and this brief interlude breaks the typical three-point coverage that's standard for these kinds of scenes. Also of note in the shot selection, when the session first begins, Laura and Rose sit together in the middle of the frame. But this is the last time that Finn allows them to be in the same frame while they're speaking. This is because both characters start with cross-purposes. Rose has the incredibly difficult task of trying to establish a trusting relationship with Laura while not colluding with her to indulge the delusions. Laura, on the other hand, is trying to convince Rose that the visions are real. These two people are in two different frames because these two people are having two different conversations. Laura reacts as though she sees something behind Rose over her shoulder and proceeds to freak out. A half second shot of Laura tumbling out of her chair is the only other time that Laura and Rose are in the same frame together. Rose calls for help, but when she turns around, Laura is standing behind her with a wicked smile on her face. This is the first unnerving leer of the film, and it works for reasons we described above. We know from the context of Laura's story and her actions only 30 seconds prior that the smile does not match her mental and emotional state. Laura is either telling the truth, and a demonic force is possessing her body and forcing it into a malevolent rictus, or Laura is dissociating to the point where another personality has taken over her body and is forcing it into a malevolent rictus and both of those are equally frightening at this point. Either way, what makes us uneasy about these shots is... the smile is a lie. Rose watches helplessly as Laura slits her own throat with a shard from a broken flower vase. Laura's smile never leaves her face, even as she bleeds out on the floor. This 13-minute sequence constitutes the film's cold open, and it does a fine job of establishing the premise of the story. What's most intriguing about the cold open is that in 11 of the first 13 minutes, the 11 that take place in the present, Rose only smiles out of rote politeness. It's barely even worthy of the name Smile. A brief smile leaks through while she's talking to the charge nurse, and again a half smile when she greets Laura for the first time. In neither of these sessions does she smile or establish warmth or empathy with her patients. For her, the smile is an obligation. The smile is a lie.
It probably won't surprise you to learn that much of the science that we have about smiling comes from highly unethical practices that never would be approved in scientific research today. In 1862, French anatomist Duchenne de Boulon discovered that there were distinct differences between fake smiles and real smiles. By applying electrodes to his patients, he could stimulate the facial muscles into an involuntary smile. Yes, he electrocuted people into smiling for him. But don't worry, he started with severed heads. He's not a monster. Duchenne's work on facial expressions was mostly ignored for nearly a century until both psychologists and anatomists agreed that yes, Duchenne had made a significant discovery when he postulated that a true smile is in the eyes, not the mouth. The lines around the eyes, or crow's feet, are better indicators as to whether a person is really smiling or trying to fake it. This led researchers to label a smile with contracted crow's feet as the Duchenne smile. And for over 50 years, the Duchenne smile was synonymous with a smile that indicated genuine emotion because most people can't consciously contract their eyes. In the early 21st century, researchers began to cast doubt on the idea of the Duchenne smile, noting many studies that proved that there were some people who could fake the smile with conscious eye contraction. But of course, anyone who's seen a Hollywood movie knows this. All of the actors that were going to be portraying smiles in the film, what we talked about was this feeling of dead eyes that do not match an incredibly uncomfortable, wide, tooth-bearing smile that was meant to feel predatory in nature. After some insensitive questions from detectives and the downright spooky image of Laura grinning at her from the darkness, Rose is startled when her fiancé Trevor comes home. He comforts her with a hug, and this is the first time that we see Rose flash the Duchenne smile with genuine happiness and relief. More on that later. Rose's relief is short-lived, though, because she and Trevor have a dinner date with Rose's sister Holly and Holly's husband Greg. Holly and Greg are judgmental about Rose's choice of career. She doesn't make nearly enough money or get to set her own hours. And Holly is upset that Rose is holding up the sale of their childhood home which they co-inherited after their mother's suicide. Why not just get the money for the land? Can you guys just shut the fuck up? Rose dives into Laura's case, trying to figure out why Laura's behavior was so strange. Joel, one of the detectives from the day before, stops by to check on Rose, and it's clear that they have a history. Rose, of course, finds that Laura reported a similar incident as the one that she just went through. In Laura's case, her college professor approached her with a claw hammer and bashed his own skull in with a smile on his face. Rose is on edge when she encounters her manic patient Carl, and is startled when he begins to shout that she's going to die, a line that played a major role in the trailer of the film. However, when the orderlies arrive at Rose's request to restrain Carl, he's just lying in his bed in the fetal position. Dr. Desai is upset that Rose would use a 5150 call so indiscriminately, since Carl had no history of aggressive behavior, and he didn't seem to be a threat to anyone when the orderlies arrived. Desai ties Rose's apprehension to Laura's death, and tells Rose to take a paid administrative leave. It's here where we learn that Desai's concerns stretch further back as he notes that Rose has been working 80-hour work weeks for months now. This means her workaholism and obsessive behaviors can't be related to Laura's death by suicide the previous day. This all represents the plot point at the end of Act 1. Laura has described a demonic presence that followed her around and smiled at her before she eventually took her own life. Rose is now seeing people stalking her and smiling at her. Rose's perceptions of the world are not matching those of the people around her. To make matters worse, the things that have given Rose comfort, Trevor, their cat Mustache, and her work are slowly being distanced from her. Mustache goes missing, Trevor is stuck at work, and Rose is on leave from her job. It's just Rose alone with her thoughts. What? Are you sure you haven't let something inside, Rose? Besides the themes of isolation, delusion, and demonic possession, Smile portrays the idea of suicide contagion. In fact, that's the demon's modus operandi. Each of the victims that we've learned about so far are shown killing themselves in horrific ways after reporting being stalked. To some extent, Smile is a metaphorical exploration of a real-life phenomenon that mental health scholars and suicide prevention experts call suicide contagion. The hypothesis is that incidents and portrayals of suicide may inspire those who are impressionable or have existing suicidal ideation to engage in copycat behaviors. This is known as the Werther Effect, named after the Goethe novel The Sorrows of Young Werther, 
which was banned in several European countries out of fears that it would cause mass suicide. This also led to suicide prevention organizations issuing guidelines for media outlets on how best to discuss the topic of suicide. Of course, the rise of the internet and social media have largely rendered those guidelines moot. Because your doctor slash lawyer slash virologist slash sourdough expert former classmate who thinks that guidelines for responsible behavior are tantamount to fascism doesn't really have to follow them. A confounding factor in the study of suicide as a public health phenomenon, though, is that there are so many moving parts. Most people who die by suicide also suffer some kind of major depressive disorder, and those disorders can have multiple factors, both biological and environmental. This is exactly what happened to mom. That's why Rose makes for a thought-provoking protagonist to explore the ideas of major depressive disorders and suicide. We're told through the opening shot that her mother died after mixing Ambien and alcohol. We also see Rose's father disappear from the picture, quite literally, as there is a family photo with both daughters, a photo of Rose's parents as a happy couple, and then a photo of just the daughters and mother with Holly refusing to fake a smile for the camera. Later, we learn that Rose failed to help her mother when she cried out for help as she succumbed to the overdose. All of this makes Rose a perfect storm for a meditation on suicide, depression, trauma, and general mental health issues. Her mother died of an overdose right in front of her. So Rose has a traumatic experience in childhood and potentially the genetic predisposition for depression and anxiety. And we know that the end game for the film's monster is to force or trick the victim into killing themselves. What makes Rose interesting is that she understands all of these issues, at least on an intellectual and therapeutic level, but she hasn't dealt with them on an experiential level. Plagued by nightmares of her mother, Rose dives deeper into Laura's case, leading to the film's best jump scare. She also sees the smiling monster again at her nephew's birthday party, during which he opens a present revealing Rose's cat mustache mutilated. It's here where Rose's emotional support system continues to crumble. Trevor leaves her after she opens up to him about the entity. Holly rejects her after the events of the party, telling her that she's acting like their mother did when they were young. Her therapist only plays things by the book, the same way Rose did with Laura. Empathetic, but ultimately refusing to indulge the delusion. The one thing that is known to mitigate suicide clusters, social support, is slowly being stripped away, leaving Rose isolated. The only person who will listen to her, albeit reluctantly, is her ex-boyfriend Joel, who helps her investigate the chain of victims. In every case but one, the witness to a suicide later died by suicide. And in that one exceptional case, the witness committed murder instead of dying by suicide. That witness, Robert Talley, tells Rose that the entity feeds on trauma. So the victim has to traumatize others in order to pass on the entity. This thing needs trauma to spread. That's what gives it power. This is the plot point at the end of Act 2, leaving Rose with a dilemma that will be solved in the third act. Whether to allow herself to be consumed by the beast or commit murder. Throughout the film, we get small glimpses of Rose's attempts to deal with her childhood trauma, and the lengths to which she will go to avoid dealing with her childhood trauma. You've been working 80-hour weeks for months. I'm concerned that you haven't been sleeping. It's not uncommon for those who have suffered severe trauma in childhood to overwork themselves to the point that they neglect healthy behaviors like sleep and diet. Researchers aren't entirely sure why this is, but it does have parallels to substance abuse and hypervigilance. We actually see this in both of the Cotter siblings. Rose dives into her work to such a degree that she sleeps at the office and obsesses over her clients in her off hours. At one point, she tries to leave the office only to dart back in and pick up a ringing phone, the phone that would lead her to Laura as a patient. What makes this moment work is that Rose didn't pick up the phone when her mother died. It's possible that the 911 call could have saved her mother. At least, 
that's what Rose assumes and feels a tremendous unmanaged guilt over. Holly, on the other hand, is just as obsessive about creating a perfect domestic life and judges Rose for not sharing those values. Over dinner, Holly rants about having to be up at 6am to make their son breakfast and lunch because she doesn't want him eating the non-organic garbage the school cafeteria serves. She shows signs of being a helicopter parent who pushes her kid into soccer, swim lessons, karate, theater, and Spanish. She also shows some signs of body dysmorphia, which can also be a coping mechanism for trauma. Like, I haven't been to Pilates in a week, so my body is so fucked. Not true. In other words, what seems like a relationship to merely be a nuisance for Rose on the surface is in fact a well-grounded portrayal of trauma. Holly is just the other side of the same coin that drives Rose throughout the film. What's most fascinating to me about Rose's behavior is just how much she controls her reputation. As a clinician, she's aware of what will happen if someone finds out just how deep her mental illness really runs. Yeah, she sounds fucking crazy to me. That was a whole box of Fruit Loops. So. Rose, there have to be plenty of crazies out there who will actually pay you for your time. Yeah. Do you hear yourself? I mean, Jesus Christ, you sound crazy. So she spends the first half of the film in constant image management. She denies having issues when she's talking to Dr. Desai. She doesn't reveal the extent of her traumatic experience with Laura, telling Trevor simply, her patient died. Again, her relationship with Trevor is the other half of the coin along with her relationship with Joel. Near the end of the film, Rose admits to Joel that she held everyone at arm's length to ensure that they didn't see who she really was, or what she was going through. And when she did feel herself allowing the walls to come down with Joel, she had to end things before he got too close. On the film's commentary track, director Parker Finn repeatedly mentions the idea of masks. In communication studies, a person's identity is portrayed as a series of faces and masks. Faces are the identities that you share with the world. These can change from audience to audience and situation to situation. We all have certain body parts we want to accentuate or certain skills that we're proud of that we want people to judge us on. The faces we show to the world emphasize those traits that we want people to see. Masks, on the other hand, hide things we don't want people to see. We hide blemishes and bald spots. We lie on our resumes. We lie about our age and our height and our weight. These are all things that we do to disguise traits that we are either ashamed of or that make us feel uncomfortable. That the way that each of them act is based upon the masks that they wear that is born out of the same childhood trauma. In Rose's case, the overworking, the milquetoast fiance, and her tendency to smile through her anxiety are masks that she wears over the pain so that she doesn't have to deal with the after effects of trauma. But while we all have aspects of our identity and personality that we don't want others to know about, there are also aspects of ourselves that other people know about that we don't. And this is where anxiety often kicks in. Anyone who plays poker with someone with a bad poker face knows this. These are unconscious micro-expressions that we're rarely aware of ourselves, but it's easy for other people to see them. For example, it's not hard for audience members to see that Rose is tightly wound from Sosie Bacon's excellent performance. She's a bundle of fidgets and side glances. But in-universe, there are people who are blind to her trauma and people who are experts in seeing through her mask. Dr. Desai and Dr. Northcutt are trauma-informed clinicians, and Joel is a cop. As each of the characters tries to pull the mask away to help heal the trauma underneath, Rose pulls away from them. This is why her relationship with her own therapist is so strained. As they started making progress initially, Rose cut off contact and dropped out of therapy. When she calls Dr. Northcutt, instead of engaging in talk therapy and uncovering deep-seated traumatic roots, she asks for a prescription for Risperdal, Risperdal is a powerful antipsychotic used to combat hallucinations that's also used for people who have mood disorders related to autism. Prescribing Risperdal would be a huge step for a first session back, but medication limits Rose's exposure. Everything in the first act of the film, and everything that precedes the film's opening, shows Rose desperately trying to keep the facade of a high-functioning professional so that no one will question her mental health, and those who do see through the mask have to be pushed out of her life even if it means sacrificing relationships. Rose consistently wears a smile to the world. And the smile is a lie. On its surface, smile is derivative of other trauma-informed horror movies like The Babadook or The Night House. But as one starts to pull back the layers of the writing and Sosie Bacon's performance, 
A story unfolds about the inability to overcome trauma based purely on intellect alone. Rose Cotter knows trauma. She studied enough to get her MD. She spent her career helping others through their pain and trauma. But overcoming your own trauma isn't about simply recognizing it. And you can't ever intellectualize it away, no matter how smart you are. To even have a chance at working through trauma, you have to be willing to feel the emotions associated with it. And that means acknowledging your trauma generates a physical, non-intellectual response that can't be reasoned with. I'm indebted to my fiancé for this metaphor on depression, but it's one that the film dramatizes expertly. Living with PTSD and depression is like living with an occasional roommate. You'll be going along fine, attending classes, going to your job, hanging out with friends, doing the grocery shopping, watching Netflix, and then one day, bam, the roommate returns. The roommate pushes you out and takes over. The roommate does the basic, bare minimum stuff to ensure that you survive. The roommate feeds you because the roommate can't afford to have you die. The roommate makes sure the bills are paid because the roommate doesn't like living on the street. But that's about it. The roommate doesn't brush your teeth for you, doesn't shower for you, doesn't brush your hair, calls off work, sends your professor an email saying you won't be in class, and the roommate sets up shop. In exchange for taking over executive function of your body, the roommate tells you what a shitty person you are for letting them take over your body in the first place. The food your roommate had you eat? It's because you're a fat, disgusting pig. The tugging gravity that kept you down as you tried to get out of bed or off the couch to walk to the shower wasn't your roommate at all. And it will tell you so. You laid prone all day because you are a lazy piece of shit. It's why no one will help you. If they loved you, they'd know you're in pain right now, and they'd help take the pain away. But no one really loves you, do they? I know they say they do, but they have to say that in order to be nice, right? I mean, how could they actually love you? Look at you. Really look at yourself in the mirror. Do you see the double chin? Do you see that acne forming at the corner of your nose? Are your eyes too far apart? Christ, look at your forehead. Is your hair thinning? Have you seen the marks your waistband is leaving on your disgusting stomach? Do you feel your bra digging into your torso more and more because you can't even get up to go out for a walk once in a while, you lazy cunt? All of this is because you're not a good person. You're just not. If you were, you'd be able to find a girlfriend. If you were, you wouldn't have lost your job. If you were, you wouldn't be struggling in your classes, you stupid fuck. If you were, you would have been more careful. If you were, you wouldn't have put yourself in that position. If you were, you wouldn't have let him abuse her for so long. If you were a real man, you wouldn't have cried over that, you pussy. If you were good instead of a conniving bitch, you would have just left that job if he was coming on to you. You're weak. You're a whore. You're fat. You're ugly. You're mean. You're stupid. You are worthless. There's a passage in Robert Louis Stevenson's novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, in which the story's protagonist, Henry Jekyll, is sitting on a park bench having vowed to never again drink the potion that turns him into Edward Hyde. Despite that, he feels himself turning into Hyde without the potion, and rushes to concoct more of it so that he can prevent the transformation. But it doesn't work. He blames Hyde's overwhelming power and will to overcome the potion. But if you know anything about mental health or addiction, you know what happened here, right? The addict part of Jekyll's brain, the part that really, really liked living without conscience or consequences, was tricking him into taking the potion again so that he would become Hyde. It's the fictional equivalent of an alcoholic's brain telling them they just need a couple of drinks so they can steady their nerves before they drive. This is how the roommate functions. The roommate is poison but it's poison that keeps you afloat while it works its way through your system. And the way it keeps you afloat is by making sure whatever happens, no one around you can know. If they know, they might push you into getting help. If they know, they might call someone. If they know, they might confirm everything that the roommate has been saying. 
And all of a sudden, you and the roommate are collaborating to keep the secret. You have to put on a happy face through the negative self-talk and insults. You access memories of what happiness looks like and replicate them for others' benefit. You have to smile through the pain. And the smile is a lie. Well, this one got heavy in a hurry, so feel free to disengage, take care of yourself, drink plenty of water, stay warm, stay safe, return your shopping carts, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>